Please open your Bibles and turn again to Matthew chapter 24. We'll certainly make reference to Matthew 24 as a number of other scriptures or scripture texts today. I don't think it would be an exaggeration for me to say that since the arrival of COVID-19 one year ago, I have received more emails with questions about the end times, the last days, and the second coming of Christ than any other inquiries related to other topics that the Bible teaches. Interest in the future at this point in time in Christian history, in world history, seems to be at an all-time high. Politicians, sociologists, and historians seem to be in agreement that with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union 30 years ago, we entered a turning point, a significant time in history. We've reached what we might call a major watershed, equal to the transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Growing political instability in our world, polarization, the rise of postmodernism, the end of Western societal acceptance of Christian ethics as a standard for sexuality and marriage, the rise and spread of, of terrorism, the decline of the United States as an influence for good in world affairs, the fear of climate change and global warming, and the incessant almost weekly news of disasters throughout the world are leading many to believe that we are, we are on the precipice of an increasingly frightening future. Now these are in many ways the contributing fa factors in Christian fascination and I might add speculation about the events that will surround the second coming of Christ. People read the book of Revelation accompanied with the latest Christian fiction novels about the second coming, and they wonder about things like the mark of the beast, who the Antichrist will be. They speculate about what are the signs of Christ's coming. And all of this then has the tendency to lead people to an impulse to see and to fit every international development in the world into another one of the sure signs that Jesus' return is imminent. And before long, any Christian with access to the internet becomes guilty of date setting. Be that as it may, there remains among disciples of Jesus a desire to know the facts about what the Bible calls the blessed hope of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So today, I begin this new preaching series entitled, Waiting for the Blessed Hope. Now the purpose of this series will be to focus on those passages of God's Word which speak about Christ's second coming. My goal is to avoid speculation. I want to avoid the imposing of men's ideas and thoughts onto the text of the Bible. Rather, my goal is to expose what the Bible clearly says so that our hearts and minds can rest in the sure, stable, and unchanging words of the prophetic writings and not on the constant changing insights of prophetic speculators. So in this message today, which is really an introduction to the whole series, I want to share, first of all, three clarifying truths about the second coming, and then secondly, four clear facts about Christ's return. Three clear truths about the second coming. Now the most important thing that the Bible teaches about the last things is that Christ is coming again. Now that is our real hope. Jesus will return. This is what the future holds for disciples of Jesus. The coming of Christ. Our Christian hope is in the end, quite simply, hope of Him. Him returning again. There are in the New Testament 318 references to the second coming of Christ. The second coming is the central reality. Our real hope is Him. Not, not all of the happenings that will surround His coming. Soon after Jesus had ascended to heaven and baptized the disciples in the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Peter proclaimed in Acts 3, God will send the Christ appointed for you. 
In the last chapter of the Bible, Jesus says, surely I am coming soon. Now, as I've said, and I will say a number of times in this series, too many Christians are fixated on the intricacies and the minutia of prophecy and prophetic fulfill- fulfillment. Speculations about the events that accompany the second coming. And when that happens, we, we miss and we even misunderstand the central event. We've become distracted from the really important thing, perhaps I should say, from the really important person. Listen, the Christian hope for the future is not a timetable of events. It is not the latest fanciful insights into how current political realities were foreseen by the prophets and in the book of Revelation. It's not the latest fad interpretations of the book of of Revelation. It's not speculating about who the Antichrist is or what 666 means. The Christian hope of the future is not concerned with a series of happenings. The heart of Christian hope is nothing other than the expectation of the personal appearing of Jesus Christ our Lord. And if our interest in the last things is centered anywhere else than in Jesus himself, then we are out of step with what God's word says. In this area of understanding the scriptures, we must keep our eyes on Christ. He is the center of God's revelation. He is the center of God's redemption. He is the center of our Christian hope. He is at the center of God's prophetic purposes for the world. The coming of Jesus is our real hope. Now the second clarifying truth concerns the last days. And the last days began a long time ago, a long time ago in Bethlehem. Now every time you celebrate your birthday, you are reminded of the first appearing of Christ, that the first appearing of Christ is the central point of history. I was born on June 27, 1956. That is, I was born 1,956 years after Christ. The first coming of Christ was the hinge of history. The decisive moment from which we date all of our time today. Every page of the history books, every copy of our daily newspapers, every check you write, every financial transaction you make or business partnership you enter into is dated. It's dated. And it all bears testimony. That is the date that you write down bears testimony to the truth and the significance of Christ's first coming because all human events are dated from his birth. So the Bible is clear that the first coming of Christ was actually the beginning of the last days. The writer to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 1 that in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. He also says in Hebrews 9 that Christ appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. This tells us that the preaching and teaching, the death and the resurrection of Christ was the beginning of the last days. The first coming of Christ brought human history to the end of the ages. Now this means that everyone listening to me speak right now was born in the last days. This means that everyone born since Christ ascended into heaven has been born in the last days. Friends, the last days are not coming The last days have arrived already. They began 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. You and I presently live in the year 2021. Now, if we were to say 2021 as was customary over 100 years ago, we would say that we live in the year of our Lord, 2021. This means that we are living right now in the 2021st year of the last days. This means that every passage in God's word which refers to the last days or describes those days 
and what those days will be like is referring to the whole span of this 2021 years, the whole span of the last days, the whole span of the past 2,000 years. So when we talk about the last days, we're not talking about 100 years before Jesus comes, 50 years, 30, 20, 10, 7, or 3. We're talking about the whole span of this age from the first coming of Christ until the second coming of Christ. And Christ's second coming will bring to an end the last days. His second coming, similarly crucial as his first coming, for by the second coming, Jesus will finalize all history. His second coming will be the hinge which links human history in this world with the life of the world to come. The last days began a long time ago. Now the third clarifying truth is that the New Testament, in the, in the New Tes- Testament, is that there are three words, three words that describe the second coming of Jesus. These three terms or words the Bible uses help us to understand what the second coming is really all about. Now the first word that the Bible uses is the word apocalypsis, from which we get our English word apocalypse or revelation. That's really what the word means, revelation. In the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, the last book of the Bible is not called the Revelation. It is called the Apocalypse, and it is rightly named so because that is the word that was used, the unveiling, the revealing of Jesus Christ. Apocalypse means revelation or unveiling. It means to reveal. It means to unveil. So the Lord's coming will simply reveal who Jesus is. At Jesus' second coming, there will be an unveiling of Jesus to the whole world. The veil will be pulled back, so to speak, and Jesus will be unveiled for the world to see. Apocalypsis. The second word is epiphania, from which we get the English word epiphany. There are churches that have this word in their name, the church of the epiphany or of the epiphania. Epiphany simply means an appearance. It means a manifestation. Something appears suddenly. A person has an epiphany. It conveys the idea of making known or making visible that which is secret or invisible right now. Paul wrote to Titus and spoke of the glorious appearing, the glorious epiphany of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Epiphany. Apocalypsis. Epiphany. The third word is Parousia or parousia, which means presence or visit or arrival. This is the most common word that is used in the New Testament writings to refer to the second coming of Christ. The word simply means presence or arrival. It is the word that was used in the ancient world for the visit of an emperor to a city or a, or a king or, or some other distinguished person who shows up, he arrives, he visits. Parousia conveys the idea that Christ's return then will be a definite and decisive action on his part. So there you have it. What is the second coming of Christ? It is an apocalypse, a revelation, an unveiling of Jesus to the world. It is the appearing of Christ, the manifestation of Christ to the world. It is the long-awaited arrival or presence of the King when he will again be present in the world. On the day Jesus returns, what is already true of him now will be revealed to the whole world. And this is why John writes in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So with these three clarifying truths in mind, I want us now to consider four clear facts about the second coming of Christ. And the first clear fact about the second coming is that it will be a personal and visible return to this earth. After Jesus informed the disciples that they would receive the power of the Holy Spirit and be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, Luke records for us some interesting words 
in Acts chapter 1. The words are that Jesus was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking up. They saw Jesus ascend. They were intently looking into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men, dressed in white, angels no doubt, stood before the the apostles who were there. And these two angels said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Now here's what I want you to notice in this verse, verse 11 of Acts 1. Notice the words of the phrase, this same Jesus, in the same way. This same Jesus, in the same way. The same person who ascended into heaven will be the same one who comes back from heaven. The same way as he went into heaven is the same way he will come back from heaven. This means that his coming will be personal and visible. Now, I want to be very, very clear as to what this means. When I was a youth pastor at Metacrest Baptist Church in Brooklyn, Ontario, and I think it was 1977, there were two very elderly ladies in that church, twins, uh, and they were members of Metacrest Church. And I remember them sharing with me that in 1927, when the Methodist, Presbyterian, and Congregational churches merged together to form the United Church of Canada, that their father was a very respected Bible teacher in an adult Bible class in their United Church congregation. These elderly sisters shared with me that they distinctly remembered that several years after the merger had happened, how their father became very distressed because their pastor openly questioned belief in the literal, physical, personal, visible return of Christ. Now, they said to me that this was the first indication to them that there was something seriously wrong in the newly formed United Church. The first indication of a theological drift and ultimately a denial of what the Bible clearly teaches. Now, what specifically did their United Church pastor say? Well, they told me it was something like this. Well, we should not take everything in the Bible literally, You know, when Jesus said he would come again, he probably meant that he would come to them again in a time of need. The hope of the second coming is that Jesus comes to us when we are in need. He comes to us in a time of bereavement. He he comes to us at a time, at the time of death. And in all of the other troubling times of life, This is what the second coming means. It's a promise that Christ will be there to help us when we need him to come. So let me be very, very clear. It is true that Jesus comes to his people when they need him. Jesus comes to us now, and he does so in the person of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you He was definitely speaking, referring to the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the head of the church, and he comes to his church. He came to his church by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost when the Father and the Son poured out the Holy Spirit. This is a spiritual coming, so to speak, of the Lord. There is a spiritual coming of Jesus. He does come to us in dark times. He does come to us in bereavement. He does come to us when we're in crisis. He does come to us at death to receive us. You and I often talk about sensing the presence of the Lord, right? And so it is wonderfully true. But that is not the second coming of Christ. When Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit, our Lord came to his church And praise God, he still comes to us spiritually, even daily by the Holy Spirit. 
providing us peace when we need peace, filling us with joy, giving us guidance. He is, as we have memorized this past year, an ever-present help in a time of trouble. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Praise God. Jesus comes to our church. He comes to the church in times of revival. The Bible refers to this as times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. He draws near near to us. And these are wonderful times when we sense his nearness, his presence. His presence is real, but spiritual. It is experiential, but invisible. But this is not what the Bible means by the parousia, the parousia. The parousia is the physical, visible presence of Christ when he will be revealed, unveiled, appear again physically. His coming will be personal, that is physical. It will be in the flesh. In Matthew 26, Matthew records for us that moment when Jesus was on trial. And Jesus said to the high priest in the midst of the, of the, the wrangling that was going on, in the future, he said, You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now this underscores what Revelation chapter 1 tells us. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. The second coming of Jesus is going to be visible to all. It is not just to those who live on the earth when he appears, but to all people throughout all time. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Those who crucified Jesus will see Jesus when he returns. This is important because there are many who think and teach that the parousia will be some secret happening, that he will only be seen by those who are his people. But friends, if you go through the passages of Scripture that speak about the second coming, they all emphasize his coming will be visible for all to see. Acts 1 verse 11 is clear. This same Jesus who you have seen go into heaven, he went into heaven physically, he went into heaven personally, he went into heaven visibly, will come again in the same way you've seen him go into heaven personally, in the flesh visibly. And the Apostle Paul makes this clear in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when he says, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. The same Jesus the Apostle saw ascend into heaven is the same Jesus we will see when he comes down from heaven. Hallelujah. Now the second point, or the second thing I need to share or fact here is that not only will this be a personal invisible return, But the second coming of Jesus will be a glorious and powerful return. In the passage of Scripture we read this morning in Matthew 24, verse 27, Jesus said, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 30, They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. With power and great glory. Again, Paul referred to the second coming as the glorious appearing of our great God. He will come in power and in glory. Now this is telling us that Christ's second coming is going to be very different than his first coming. Jesus' first coming was actually a very obscure event. I know it's true that there was the appearance of angels, there were announcements that were made by those angels, and the Shekinah glory in the form of a star guided the Magi as they came from the east to where the child Jesus was. Yes, the glory of God was there at the birth of Christ, but it was only to a small group of shepherds who were encompassed with the glory of the Lord as it shone in the Bethlehem fields. It was only a small group of Magi from the east who saw the glory in the star. For the most part, the coming of Jesus into the world, the wonder we call Christmas, passed by virtually unnoticed. His first coming did not capture the news headlines. He was born a human being to poor Palestinian Jewish parents. 
These two words, power and glory, are used, I believe, in contrast to his first coming. His second coming will be in power, but his first coming was in weakness. He walked this earth in the weakness of humanity. As an infant, he was dependent on his mother's milk. His life was sustained by the food, love, and care that Mary and Joseph provided for him. He was dependent on finding a, finding a coin in a fish's mouth in order to pay his taxes. He lay exhausted, sleeping in a boat after he had expended his physical and emotional energy. And after 40 days in the, in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, Jesus was so weak that he required the assistance of angels to minister to him in his weakness. And at his crucifixion, the, the people gathered in their ringside seats and they, they shouted, if you are the Son of God, save yourself, come down from the cross. They were mocking him for his weakness. And the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, that he was crucified in weakness. At his second coming, all of this is going to change. It will be a public and glorious manifestation of his person. Gone forever will be the weakness and the obscurity. Now will be the glory, the kingship, and the acclaim. All men and women from every age of history will be confronted by the person of Jesus, and they will be forced to acknowledge that he is supreme and triumphant. For every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The glorious nature of Jesus' coming is expressed in reference to the clouds of heaven. We saw that in Matthew 24, Matthew 24, verse 30. The Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. John the Apostle uses similar words in Revelation, saying he is coming not on the clouds, but with the clouds, with the clouds. Now this image comes from the prophet Daniel chapter 7 where Daniel writes, In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Now when you and I read coming with the clouds, we think of the clouds that are up there in the sky above, above us. But that's not what this is actually referring to. This is a reference to the Shekinah glory of God. Remember to the Israelites the Shekinah glory appeared in the Exodus as a pillar of cloud in the daytime. A pillar of cloud, a bright shining cloud. This happened again at the transfiguration of Christ when Jesus appeared to Peter, James, and John. And Matthew tells us that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And all of the gospel writers tell us that Jesus was enveloped at the transfiguration in a bright cloud. And the voice of God came out of that cloud. This is my son. Listen to him. And then again at his ascension into heaven in Acts 1, we read that a cloud hid him from their sight. The phrase coming with the clouds means that Jesus' coming will be glorious, like the glory, the Shekinah glory of God. His glory, which was veiled in his first coming, will be unveiled in his second coming. Friends, the one who bowed his head in the weakness of death will one day speak with power, and the dead who are in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of God and they will live. The same voice which spoke the universe into being is the voice that will speak at the second coming. In power, he will summon the world to, to ju judgment. He will consume the world in his anger, and he will establish his kingdom forever. His glory will be revealed according to his own words. His glory will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to another. There will be a bursting forth of the glory of God at the coming of Jesus. His coming will be glorious and powerful. His coming will also be a decisive return, a decisive return. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that great passage which talks about the coming resurrection, it says in verse 23 and 24 that when Jesus comes, it says, then will the end come. Then will the end come. The second coming will be the end. Listen, the second coming will be the terminal point for life in this world. At his coming, the the long march of the ages will be halted. The scheming and the plotting of evil men will be ended. The last page of the history books will be written. The last act in the human drama will be played out, and then the curtain will fall on the stage of time. The end. Christ will come. This means that the Lord's second coming is the point to which all human history is moving. It is the destination to which your life and my life is headed. The significance of the end of this even at the end of time is only comp- comparable to that moment of creation at the beginning. This means that the second coming of Christ is an event that is written into every human diary. It is written down in every time schedule. It is written down in every work planner and every day timer. It will be an event in history, in the history of all men and all women who have ever lived on this planet. As I said before, this will not be an event confined to the, 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 just to those living on the earth at that time. No, every eye will see him. Every person who has lived throughout history, even those who pierced him, and all the earth will mourn because of him. Every human knee will bow and every human tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Listen, every human being is moving toward a rendezvous with Jesus Christ. Whether you are a believer or not, you are going to meet Jesus Christ when he comes back. Christ's coming will be a decisive return. Finally, Christ's coming will also be a sudden and an unexpected return. The recurring note that keeps coming up in many of the New Testament references to the second coming is this unexpectedness that accompanies his return. Jesus said it in Matthew 24, verse 44. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now to enforce this point, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus reminded his disciples of the flood that came in Noah's days. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. The flood came during Noah's days with total unexpectedness. Even though, even though Noah had preached that the flood was coming, The people did not believe it. They did not expect it to come. And so Jesus in Matthew 24 says that people were eating and they were drinking. They were marrying and being given in marriage. What did he mean by that? Well, in other words, Jesus was saying they were just simply carrying on with the normal everyday things of life. They were looking about the normal, thinking about the normal assumptions about tomorrow, about next week, about next month, about next year. All of the usual planning for life in family, in career, and society continued when suddenly and completely unexpected, the flood came and Jesus says, took them all away. In other words, the the day of Jesus' return will in one sense be like any other day on this planet. Businesses will be, go- will be doing their business. Governments will be governing. Workers will be going to their jobs and doing their jobs. People will be planning for marriage, planning for a, a, fam- a, fam- a, fa- a family, providing for them, booking their holidays, dreaming of job promotion, dreaming of a raise at work. And suddenly Jesus will come. The parousia will arrive with complete unexpectedness. This is how Jesus put it. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men in the field. 
One will be taken, taken away, like the people of Noah's day, taken away, the other left. Two women grinding at the mill, one taken, the other left. Like the people in Noah's day who were taken away suddenly and unexpectedly in, in judgment. So it will be when Jesus returns, people will be taken away to be judged. Now Jesus underlined this in the three parables that he told in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. In the first par- parable he gave, he spoke about a man who owned a house and a thief who broke into the owner's house in the middle of the night. And if the owner, of course, had known when the thief was coming, the owner would have been ready and he would not have allowed him to come into his house. And Jesus said, you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. The second parable Jesus told was of a master, a rich man who goes away from his home for a long time and he he leaves his house and his state in the care of his servants. They don't know when their master's coming back, and when he comes, he will find that one of the servants has been fooling around, has not been a good servant at all, a good servant of the house that was left in his care. And Jesus said, the master of that servant will come on a day he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. And the third and final parable that Jesus told is called the parable of the ten virgins, It's about that ancient Jewish custom of providing attendants for the bridegroom at a wedding. Those attendants were not the groom's men, but rather they were the bride's maids. And the girls would go out to meet the groom as he would make his way into the city or into the town for the wedding celebration. And they would escort him, accompany him into the hall where the bride was waiting. But in Jesus' story, some of the girls did not prepare themselves adequately. They're unprepared when the groom arrives at an unexpected time. And Jesus said again, therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. And perhaps the clearest reference to the unexpectedness of Christ's return comes in a statement which Jesus makes in Matthew 24 verse 36 where he says, no one knows about the day or the hour not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now think about this. Jesus is the eternal Son of the Father, yet he confesses within the self-imposed limitations of his having become a man that he was at that moment ignorant of the time of the glorious appearing and second coming. It's clear And undeniable then that the hour, the time of Jesus' return in power and glory cannot be known with any precision. It will be sudden. It will be an unexpected return. Brothers and sisters in Christ, these are the four facts about the second coming of Christ of which the Bible is very clear. But they're not the only facts. The Bible has much more to say about the things which Jesus will do when he returns in power and in glory. Keep this in mind. His return will be a singular, a singular event, but it is also a multifaceted event. So the things which Jesus will do are incredibly amazing, and in the coming weeks we will explore some of these important things together. Until then, I want to leave you with these two takeaway points. The first is this. Fill your hearts with this hope. This is our real hope that Christ is coming again. This is the hope that we all have because when we see Jesus, we will be like Jesus. So fill your hearts with this hope. Secondly, let me speak to those of you who are watching today. Uh, You may be Uh, You you, you may have a a, a relative in your home who's encouraged you to watch today. Or you may have just found us on the internet. I don't know, but you're watching today and and, and all of this is new to you. And you, you can't say that you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. The thing I would encourage you to do today is to get ready for the day of Christ's return. Are you ready for Christ to come if he were to come even now? 
You see, when Jesus returns, that will be the end of any opportunity that you have to hear the truth that Jesus Christ can save you, a sinner who needs his sins forgiven. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And the Bible underscores that truth, that now is the time for you to come to Christ because when Christ comes, there will be no other opportunity to do so. So I encourage you, if you're a believer, to fill your heart with this hope. And if you haven't come to Christ yet, to get ready today for that day. I want to thank you for joining us today for this online time of worship. And I want to encourage you that if you want Christ to be your Savior, that you would contact us. You can do so through our, web, our website. Or if you have questions that are of a spiritual nature, we would be happy to help you and to answer those questions that you have. So please, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And now to him who loves us, and freed us from our sins by his blood. To him be power and glory forever and ever. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen.